Hi, I'm Gretchen Stevens. I'm a biologist with Hudsonia, which is a, an environmental research institute based here in the Hudson Valley of New York. Today we're on a virtual field trip uh, looking at various kinds of habitats here in the Millbrook Preserve uh, in the village of New Paltz in Ulster County, New York. This is a program uh, we're conducting in partnership with the Hudson River Estuary Program of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation uh, and, uh, and with Cornell University uh, and funded by the New York State Environmental Protection Fund. Here we are on a tributary to the Millbrook uh, in the Millbrook Preserve. This small stream rises in a wetland complex about a mile east of here, uh, and it flows uh, into Millbrook, uh, which eventually flows into the Wallkill. In this virtual field trip, we'll look at uh, a number of different uh, stream segments that illustrate various uh, aspects of stream habitats. We'll talk about the uh, habitat quality uh, in those places. We'll talk about the effects of uh, nearby land uses uh, on those stream areas. We'll talk about some of the animals that use the uh, different kinds of habitats in these streams. This is the kind of stream that is uh, protected uh, by, um, at least somewhat, by federal and state uh, uh, water uh, regulations uh, and protected by some local uh, regulations of streams. Here we're uh, in uh, Millbrook, just a few hundred feet downstream of the uh, area that we were at earlier. This is a reach of the stream that has a gravelly uh, substrate, a substrate of rocks and, uh, and, and gravel. Uh, it is uh, slightly silted here, but not, not heavily so. A stream with, a, with this kind of substrate uh, might be a fairly decent uh, spawning habitat for several species of fish. Um, it, uh, the stream is shaded here by the forest, which is, uh, which very, uh, is very closely adjacent on the banks. Um, uh, and a, a stream like this that is uh, cool uh, and dark uh, provides uh, a lot of habitat for some of our more sensitive stream species. Um, there, I've seen a lot of uh, caddisfly uh, larvae here. Um, uh, we have a uh, the, the the shed carapace of a uh, crayfish. Uh, there are lots of water striders here, and water striders are ubiquitous in uh, streams and water bodies throughout the region. Other kinds of things uh, besides the gravelly bottom that would affect stream habitats here are things like uh, pools. We have a slightly pooled area here. Just upstream we have uh, some riffles. Uh, things like riffles and rapids and falls, small and large falls, are very important for uh, oxygenating the water. High levels of dissolved oxygen are very important for a lot of the animals that, that, that inhabit streams. Um, over here, uh, the, the bank of the stream is somewhat undercut, um, and there, there is the uh, roots of this tree that are overhanging the stream. Areas like that uh, provide cool, shaded areas that are taken advantage of by uh, many fish uh, at times, um, both as cover when they are hunting and as cool areas when they, uh, when they need them. Places like that with overhanging roots are also sought out by uh, wood turtles. They use them 
uh, really at any time of year. They also especially use them in the winter uh, when they get up into the tangled roots and, uh, and find shelter throughout the winter months um, before they emerge again in the spring. The, uh, the deep shade, uh, cool water temperatures, uh, the fairly clear water, um, the duration of flow, uh, all of these uh, kinds of habitat features are uh, important determinants of the kinds of uh, animal life that will inhabit a stream like this but also nearby land uses. Uh, a stream can be very uh, readily damaged by disturbance of soils nearby, by inadequate stormwater management on a construction site or, a, uh, or, or from an urban area or a residential area. Um, uh, a stream, though, that is protected by a well-vegetated uh, floodplain and adjacent area uh, is more likely to maintain a lot of the habitat characteristics that are so important to many of the sensitive stream organism, uh, organisms. There are many uh, details of the stream habitats that are invisible to us. Um, uh, one of the important features of uh, any stream is what is called the hyporheic zone. And this is a zone that might be just a few centimeters deep, uh, or it might be several meters deep, depending on the hydrology uh, and, uh, and geology of the region. It's a zone where the stream water uh, and the groundwater mix, and uh, there's a lot that goes on in that zone. The, uh, that uh, mixing uh, of the two water sources, um, uh, the, uh, the the flow uh, through through that zone, um, the biological uh, interactions that occur in that zone uh, are all important determinants of uh, the water quality, um, the kinds of invertebrates uh, that occur in the stream, uh, and the quality of the fish spawning habitat. That hyporheic zone is the place where uh, uh, some of the pollutants in a stream are uh, transformed into less harmful substances. Um, when you get a lot of siltation running into a stream that's clogging up the, uh, the gaps between uh, the uh, particles in, this, in the stream substrate, uh, you're likely to be degrading the functioning of the hyperreic zone for all those good purposes. Uh, siltation in a stream can damage uh, a great many uh, aspects of the stream ecology, and the damage can last for a long time. We're at the site of a collapsed uh, concrete dam. This is on the same stream, just a little bit upstream of where uh, we were at our last stop. In the 1700s and 1800s, many of our small streams had not just one, but multiple dams uh, like this uh, that were part of uh, water-powered mills. These were for sawmills and grist mills, and woolen mills and paper mills. Um, in, uh, water power was the major source of power for industry uh, in those centuries. Um, Although uh, water power is a fairly clean uh, source of energy, that is, it doesn't add uh, harmful substances to the, to the water uh, or the soils, uh, it actually has a very large impact on the stream ecology. Uh, dams like this act as a uh, impermeable barrier for many of the animals that need to move upstream and downstream to fulfill various aspects of their life history. Many of these old dams uh, are, uh, are now crumbled like this. Those that were made of uh, timber have simply rotted away. Um, but some dams, uh, you know, 100 and more years old are still intact um, and still 
creating that barrier that cuts off the entire lower part of the screen from the upper part. Uh, a screen is a continuous ecosystem. Many of the animals need to move upstream and downstream to find various kinds of habitats um, to, that suit their, their life cycle needs, that suit their needs during certain weather conditions, during, during certain flow conditions. Um, and cutting off uh, a stream with a, an impermeable barrier uh, reduces the uh, habitat available to them in, in very severe ways. Um, but when a, a dam uh, crumbles like this or is breached in some other way, it allows the stream to flow uh, fairly freely. Uh, right here, just upstream of the dam, this is uh, bedrock we're looking at here. Uh, that has created these two uh, little falls and this little riffle area. These areas can be very important to the stream uh, for uh, helping to improve the dissolved oxygen levels in the stream, which is, is a very important habitat component. So we've just been walking through an upland forest with very little in the understory. There were a few seedlings of black cherry and some of the other overstory species and, uh, and very little ground cover. And we suddenly come to a, a place like this where the ground cover is uh, dense and, grow and growing lushly. What we're seeing here is uh, some skunk cabbage. And, and here in front of me uh, is water that's flowing very gently down, down slope. It might not come through very well on film, but we are on a gently sloping hillside that's sloping down toward the stream that we were in at, in at the last stop. <clears throat> but here, we're not in a basin. Uh, we're not on a floodplain. Um, we're not in one of those areas that typically collects water. This place is uh, fed by groundwater seepage. That uh, It's water that emerges uh, at the ground surface under gravitational pressure. Um, at the head of this little this little flowing stream is actually a spring where water is emerging at a single location, but throughout this wet area that's so heavily vegetated, uh, there are seeps uh, emerging that are keeping it wet, uh, even uh, during this time of the summer where it has been uh, very dry this year. Springs and seeps uh, like this have uh, a great many ecological values. They uh, are used by a lot of uh, plants and animals, both those that reside uh, in the, uh, the, the, the spring water and in the uh, seepage habitat, uh, and uh, animals that use them intermittently. Um, many of these areas that have a long duration flow they uh, stay open through the winter when many other uh, water sources are frozen. These become important water sources for uh, animals in the winter. These are also places that green up very early in the spring. Uh, you'll, if you come out here in, uh, in late February or March, you'd probably find lots of evidence of, uh, of uh, deer uh, uh, grazing and other animals that are taking advantage of the green vegetation after they've had a, a long winter of browsing on <coughs> uh, twigs and bark. <coughs> um, these uh, springs and seeps uh, are also the very uh, outer headwaters of many of our streams. Um, there are many streams that begin right where a spring emerges from the ground. Um, these, uh, the water in these places emerges usually at a fairly constant temperature, somewhere between 45 and 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, uh, and 
that those cool temperatures can be very important to maintaining the cool temperatures in the streams that bees, uh, that bees feed. Some springs and seeps actually discharge directly into a stream or, or onto the stream banks. Um, uh, some of them discharge directly into other larger wetlands. But many of them discharge into an upland forest area like this or an upland meadow area and those are the ones we tend to notice. They do create a very localized wetland here. Okay, here we are on a, uh, another little tributary uh, to the Mill Brook. This little stream has a substrate of cobbles and, and gravel over very dense clay soil. A lot of the soil in the Millbrook Preserve is clay. <clears throat> here is a small riffle uh, running down through here, uh, running into this small pool, which is usually filled with tiny little fish that love these little pools. We have all along this cutaway bank uh, these uh, over, overhanging roots. Um, as we did in the, uh, in, in, at an earlier stop. These kind of shady, cool places uh, can be a very important component of a stream habitat. A stream channel running through this kind of flat terrain uh, over time tends to migrate uh, laterally, um, uh, often uh, large distances changing the location of the stream channel um, quite, quite dramatically at times. Sometimes it is uh, incremental changes due to stream bank erosion. Sometimes it is a, a very abrupt change during a large runoff event. But what this stream has done is created uh, this, this large loop all the way around which uh, we call an oxbow. Um, this is where the stream channel is today. Um, uh, at uh, another big runoff event, it's quite possible that the stream would jump its bank over at the base of the hill, the far side, and simply run straight down, cutting off this loop. And this could remain a secondary channel, or this could be cut off uh, and uh, become dry or become a, an oxbow pool. Here we are just a few feet downstream. Um, we have uh, over there another little riffle running into this pool, which again is, is uh, filled with small fish. Um, we have a, a log running across here. Uh, logs like this and other kinds of woody debris uh, in streams can be uh, huge contributors to the habitat quality of a stream. They provide uh, shelter uh, and shade. They provide uh, perching habitat for hunting animals. Um, uh, they provide food uh, as they slowly decay and become food for the uh, invertebrates of the stream. Also over here we have a gravel bar. Um, gravel bars uh, often form in places where the water uh, slows and the heavier material uh, settles out. Um, they are habitats in their own right. Um, uh, lots of things especially uh, use these kinds of places along streams. Waterfowl will use them for resting um, uh, or roosting. Sometimes you'll see uh, spotted sandpipers uh, moving along these uh, bars, probing them for uh, invertebrates. Um, I've seen turtle nesting on, uh, on gravel bars, the nest might not survive. Uh, the same for some of the waterfowl nests if the waters rise before the, uh, before the hatchlings have emerged. Okay, so uh, here we are at a different looking uh, kind of stream. This uh, stream is dry today. Um, this is a generally rocky stream. Uh, this kind of dry stream uh, in, in midsummer uh, is very typical of the kinds of streams that do not appear on uh, public maps. Um, 
on the, uh, the maps available through the state, the Hudson Valley Natural Resource Mapper, or the uh, USGS topographic maps, they won't show this stream. Yet this is very clearly a stream. In fact, it's a stream that carries a lot of water at times. We can tell that because it is somewhat embedded here in the landscape. It has quite deeply uh, eroded uh, this bank behind me. Um, uh, so this is a, a stream, it's contributing at least at times probably a lot of water to the uh, downstream areas. This eventually runs into uh, Mill Brook. Um, and um, another thing that I notice is that there's a lot of siltation that's uh, coming down this stream. These pool areas <coughs> there uh, and here are quite uh, deeply silted. This is deep silt that's covering up a lot of the rock uh, and gravel substrate. Um, siltation like this can uh, damage the stream habitat. Um, in many ways it can destroy the habitat for uh, many of the invertebrates uh, that need uh, sort of clean, well oxygenated gravel. Um, uh, it can uh, destroy the habitat for, uh, or at least degrade it for, fish that might be coming up a small stream like this when it is flowing and using this uh, stream as a nursery habitat. Um, this kind of silt can deplete the food sources for, for small fish using an area like this. Where did the silt come from? I don't know. Uh, I haven't uh, examined this uh, upslope up of here, but very often this kind of uh, sediment comes in from construction sites or from uh, uh, urban uh, roads and parking lots. Um, uh, and uh, where the stormwater has not been adequately managed. So uh, it can uh, damage a small stream like this. Some of these sediments probably washed right down into Mill Brook and did further uh, damage down there. So here we are in uh, an upland deciduous forest uh, here on my right, sloping down this way and, and suddenly we're moving into a very different kind of landscape. Um, where all this lush vegetation is, uh, uh, is uh, another seep. Um, I, I'm calling it a seep because this is a wet area as uh, signified by the wetland plants that I'm seeing, uh, sensitive fern, uh, skunk cabbage, uh, jewelweed, a lot of our old favorites, uh, fowl, manna grass. Um, uh, but all of this is on this sloping hillside, and uh, if this were not being fed uh, fairly continuously by groundwater, uh, this would be dry. The water would simply be running off, and that would be the end of it. Um, so this is another of our seeps uh, that has created this very localized wetland in this up, up in the forest. So here we are at one of the many springs uh, that is feeding this seepage area. Um, it's dry there, it's wet here suddenly on this uh, sloping hillside. Um, the spring has created this little wet channel running down here. Uh, and then just a little farther down, it has created a recognizable stream channel that continues on down the slope. Many of our larger streams begin just like this, a stream channel that kind of coalesces uh, uh, in a seep um, and gathers water as it continues down the hill and eventually forming a more recognizable stream farther down. In this seep, I would expect to find animals like a uh, northern dusky salamander uh, or a two-line salamander. I'd expect to see frogs at times, like a green frog uh, or a pickerel frog uh, hopping around in here. You could have uh, dragonflies uh, that are uh, breeding here. Uh, laying their eggs and developing into, into adults. There are some dragonfly species, including some rarities, that are especially tied to
to these uh, seepage areas and spring. Protection of uh, streams at the local level is often tied to the duration of water um, uh, running in the channel, uh, tied to the configuration of the stream channel and the banks. Um, and it may at times be difficult to uh, recognize whether a channel like this that you're looking at uh, is jurisdictional under some local regulation. Uh, this seep uh, and this little stream, I would say, uh, uh, does fall under the jurisdiction of the Federal Clean Water Act uh, because all of this is connected downstream uh, to uh, other intermittent streams and then perennial streams that eventually run into the, into the wall kill. Here we're at another uh, very small stream. Uh, this has a very slight little flow uh, today. Um, this happens to be the very stream that we, we saw coming together in the seep uh, that, that we just stopped at. Um, so this has uh, flow today, uh, even though some of the other equally small streams around here do not, because uh, they probably don't have the same kind of uh, uh, continuous uh, groundwater flow. Um, this one is also quite heavily uh, silted. A lot of sediments have washed in and covered what would have been a rocky substrate. Uh, with is deep uh, silt. This has probably washed in from some disturbance farther uh, up in the, uh, in the watershed. Um, this uh, can greatly affect the kinds of animals that will use this kind of stream. Uh, many of the, um, uh, there's a green frog there, uh, the invertebrates that would use a gravelly bottom stream uh, would not be able to survive in a place like this where the sediments have been smothered by, uh, uh, by the, uh, the dense uh, and, and, and deep siltation. The other thing that distinguishes this from the previous stream is it has this really broad little band of wetland uh, along it. Uh, this is the, the, you know, the tiny little floodplain of of this stream that is generally running down this hillside, but it is sort of flattening out here, and this uh, wetland uh, broadens out uh, farther downstream. And so here we are in a very different kind of place. This uh, little stream uh, that kind of meanders through this broad, flat, floodplain. Uh, this is uh, narrow. It's about the size of the other streams we've seen, but this is, uh, this is very different. It has this very uh, uh, muddy substrate. This is uh, very fine material. There's a lot of clay, uh, as there is throughout this site at the Millbrook Preserve. <coughs> um, this uh, is the kind of place where you'd get a very different uh, array of animals using it. The, um, uh, it has a narrow uh, area of um, wetland plants along the stream, both in the stream and on the banks. <clears throat> Another interesting thing about this area within this broad uh, floodplain we have these standing snags, uh, the standing dead trees. And those, that's a phenomenon that usually you see in a place where the water level has changed. Probably not too long ago, these trees were alive. Uh, they, uh, w and in this fairly wet area, they can survive well. But at some point, uh, it's my speculation that the water level rose. Um, the trees were not able to survive with their roots uh, being drowned. Um, and so they died. This is a phenomenon that uh, regularly occurs in, 
in places where there's been some obstruction that floods an area. In this kind of place, uh, you know, a fairly wild situation where there aren't, there isn't a lot of new construction going on, most often that is caused by a, a beaver dam. So here we are uh, just upstream of the place we uh, were just looking at. Uh, here is a beaver dam. Uh, it's impounding water above it. There's also a little beaver dam below here, which we can't see from this spot, that's impounding this water right next to us. In fact, there is a whole series of beaver dams uh, running up about a half a mile of the Mill Brook at this location. Um, this is a really uh, interesting habitat where uh, beaver <coughs> find uh, a stream that is in the right kind of top uh, topography um, and has the right kind of vegetation, mainly uh, the right kinds of trees. Uh, they uh, often build a dam like this out of sticks and mud. The dam impounds uh, water behind it, sometimes creating very large ponds. Um, the purpose of the dam is to uh, give them uh, better access to food, uh, which is mostly the trees and shrubs uh, <clears throat> that are flooded by the pond and that are near the pond. Um, they also, th these ponds often develop marshy vegetation, which you can see there in the, uh, in the background. Uh, the beaver also uh, consumes some of that vegetation. Um, these, uh, the, the whole series of habitats that uh, develops uh, after the beaver build their dam uh, offer a lot of uh, value to the biological landscape. Here we are at the uppermost dam in this whole series of dams and beaver ponds uh, along the, the Mill Brook. Um, compared to human-built dams of concrete and stone and timbers, beaver dams tend to be much more permeable to the animals using the streams uh, and the ponds. Um, uh, fish can often get through uh, the areas where water is still flowing through the dam. Uh, uh, invertebrates can often uh, get through or surmount the dam. Uh, and salamanders find the dams easy to, to surmount. Um, uh, so we don't uh, look on these as the same kind of impermeable barrier um, as we do for the uh, dams that, that uh, we all have built for, uh, uh, for industry. I want to also say a few things about the ecological services provided by uh, the beavers uh, uh, when they build these dams and impoundments. Uh, a uh, beaver pond can be a very significant area of flood, uh, flood water storage. Um, and in a place like this where they have built this whole series of dams and ponds on the Mill Brook, um, this is, they're creating a tremendous area of, of flood storage that will help to reduce the amount of flooding that might occur in downstream areas along Mill Brook. Um, another thing is that these uh, ponds have been found to, in, in, in many cases, improve the water quality of the stream. Um, studies have shown that the water quality in the stream above the impoundment um, compared to the water quality of the stream below the impoundments, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the quality has been greatly improved. The nutrients have been uh, reduced, uh, which is a good thing for uh, many of the stream organisms. Um, uh, other can uh, contaminants have been reduced. Um, and I think the, the mechanism is that the, uh, the vegetation in the beaver pond, uh, as well as the sediments, uh, have a chance with the water residing there for long periods, have a chance to uh, take up the nutrients and other contaminants, have a chance to transform them to other less harmful substances. Um, so 
uh, there are many good reasons uh, for us to appreciate uh, uh, beaver uh, and the uh, and the habitats that they produce. They serve the ecosystem in general in a great many ways, and they 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 serve us who are concerned about uh, flooding and uh, and water quality. So this uh, ends our virtual field trip uh, uh, about streams uh, here in the Millbrook Preserve. Uh, we talked about a number of things here, uh, all relating to streams in one way or another. We talked about the habitat characteristics of streams, uh, the stream bottoms, the, uh, the substrates uh, of rock or silt or gravel, uh, some characteristics of the banks, uh, and the ways that those characteristics might influence uh, some of the animals that use the streams. Uh, we talked about uh, lots of different kinds of organisms that use the streams even uh, as transients uh, and the importance of the streams to the larger ecosystem. We talked about the contributions of seeps and springs uh, for uh, maintaining the uh, base flows of streams uh, and helping to maintain the cool water temperatures of streams that are so important to many of the stream uh, organisms. Uh, we talked about ecological services. Uh, uh, for example, the aspects of streams that can improve water quality uh, and the importance of intact floodplains for flood storage. Uh, also, the importance of the floodplains for feeding the stream environments uh, in various ways, uh, supporting the, the stream ecosystem. We uh, talked about the outsized value of uh, beaver ponds. Uh, uh, and the whole array of habitats that, that they trigger uh, in the environment that has helped to shape the entire ecological landscape of the Northeast over thousands of years. And we talked a little about the importance of buffer zones, the importance of keeping uh, 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 land areas adjacent to streams uh, uh, free of certain kinds of disturbance. Uh, to help maintain the integrity of the, of the streams. So uh, thank you for, for being with us and hope you all will get a chance to visit the Millbrook Preserve uh, at some time.